And this is the Stop Climate Chaos webinar. Um, and it is, it is really lovely to see um, so many people here uh, on such a glorious, unexpectedly lovely evening. Um, my name is Anya um, and I will be um, hosting this webinar. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by Saib O'Neill, who's the policy coordinator with Stop Climate Chaos, um, Oshin Coughlin uh, with Friends of the Earth, Rose Wall with the Community Law and Mediation Society, Gary Tobin from USI and Selena Donnelly from Trocra. Um, and what we'll be doing tonight is we will be bringing you to, through two um, big announcements that happened this week. One is um, the new draft of the climate bill um, and one is a new climate consultation, a public climate consultation that has been launched by the government. So what we'll be doing is first of all, Sive will take us through what is in this new draft of the climate bill? What does it look like? What does it mean? What do we think? Um, Selena and Rose will give us some uh, reactions from the social justice and climate justice uh, viewpoints. Um, and Oshin will be giving us some reaction on some of the issues around gas and some other issues. Um, there will be a copy of the, there will be um, a recording of the webinar. So don't worry if you need to go or you wanna send this on to someone else, it will be emailed out to you. Um, after that, uh, I will be bringing you through the climate consultation and what that looks like. Um, and myself and Gary will be having a bit of chat about what that looks like um, and how we might be engaging around it. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So a lot to pack into an hour, we'll try and get through it. Um, the only thing um, I wanted to draw your attention to is that there is a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can submit questions. Um, wh what you will be able to do is you can upvote some questions. So if you like a question, um, please click on the up arrow. And the questions that rise to the top are the ones that we will be answering first. Um, so if you really want a question to be answered or it's similar to a question you would have asked, please do vote it up. Um, because if there's lots of questions, it can get overwhelming. There's already 258 people on the call. So if we can group questions together, it's gonna to make our lives easier and we're gonna be able to get through more. So I'm now going to hand over to Sive. I'll put a copy of Sive's slides in the chat so you can follow along if that's easier for you. Um, but uh, yeah, Sive, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm going to speed us through um, the, uh, sorry, I actually don't know if I have. Sive, you're muted. Not, can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear Sive. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. A technical glitch. I'm not plugged in at all. No, sorry. Just, we can just hear you, Sive. We can, can hear you, you now. Yeah, I wasn't plugged in. I wasn't using my mic. Um, so I'm going to take you through a very quick presentation. I won't be able to cover a lot of the text in any detail at all. Um, so a lot of this will come up in our chat. But I, I've put a few things in the slides and I've shared the link to the slides so that you can have a look at them yourselves uh, and go through it in a bit more detail. I can't say this is the most comprehensive analysis because we just haven't had enough time to put this particular presentation together. And a lot of our processing of the bill is still in, in train. But just to remind ourselves why we're here and why this bill is so important. Uh, we've recognised for a long time that we need a legally binding law to set uh, an ultimate um, uh, legally binding envelope for our greenhouse gas emissions that's consistent with our legal obligations under the Paris Agreement and existing EU directives. And there's a recognition that we need to do that in legislation as opposed to just having a policy statement because only a law establishes clear duties and responsibilities to government ministers and sets out the kind of process by which uh, carbon budgets and so on would be established. Unlike policies, laws create legal mechanisms for accountability, and that's why they're so important. Um, this is hardly likely to be controversial, but it's just to remember that we do already have a Climate Act. This is uh, a relatively new um, thing where a, low, uh, a, a national climate law is actually being revised. And the existing climate legislation we've had has only been in operation for five years, and it had a number of features that are listed there. Um, but the problem, of course, is that um, it's very obvious that that framework legislation did not adequately address um, the greenhouse gas emissions that Ireland was producing. 
And you can see from the graph here that from uh, 2015 onwards, emissions actually started to increase overall and weren't decreasing. And the reason for that is because the bill didn't set a quantitative target for emissions. It gave the government wide discretion in how it implemented the policies and it didn't really establish clear duties on ministers of government as to how they would go about their functions and how they would address climate limits if you like in their day-to-day -day functions there was no carbon budgeting mechanism so there was a sense in which a long-term target could be just left for future generations to address and ultimately of course the national mitigation plan was quashed in the supreme court not necessarily because of a weakness in the act but it just um the whole it, the, the, all the different elements of the legislation were not robust were not strong and were not designed to bring ireland into compliance with the paris agreement so roll on to 2020 we have the program for government which established a political commitment to a seven percent decrease in emissions every year uh, or 51 percent reduction over the decade and to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, which would be a target set down in law. Uh, it, they committed to introducing the bill within the first 100 days and a draft bill was published in October. But as we all know, it contained a lot of serious weaknesses and omissions that um, took a number of months to uh, be addressed following pre-legislative scrutiny by the Joint Oireachtas Committee. That was a very good process. It, it allowed the committee to tease out in legal language the kind of elements that would need to be in the bill to make it much tighter and more robust and to do all the things that the original legislation had singularly failed to do. Um, so what did we get? Well, uh, the first thing to say is that we got definitely in this bill that was published this week, a very uh, firm definition of a national climate objective, um, which addressed a lot of the recommendations, including our own, um, you know, compared with the 2020 draft. So now the National Climate Objective, um, it uh, sets an objective to uh, uh, achieve net zero emissions by the end of year 2050. And that now it's an obligation on the government to both pursue and achieve this uh, rather than just pursue it. By no later than suggests that obviously if it happened earlier, that would be better. That's still a little bit weak. But in, interestingly, the uh, definition reintroduces environmentally sustainable, which had been taken out of the October draft. And it also includes a recommendation from the Joint Rectors Committee to a biodiversity rich. And while that isn't very clearly defined, it's obvious that the climate objective now includes a reference to biodiversity in, in the sense that we can't be going backwards. We certainly can't have policies implemented to achieve the climate objective that would make biodiversity worse. So I actually think that's quite significant. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the details in the bill. There was a few areas where we had identified quite significant weaknesses and they were they were uh, made very clear as well by a lot of the expert witnesses that came before the Joint Oireachtas Committee. So what was worrying about the October draft was that the obligations of the minister and the government uh, weren't uh, consistent with the different elements in the bill. So it wasn't obvious that the budgets were going to be consistent with the political targets and that there was no sense in which all the elements of the bill would be joined up properly together with clear duties on the ministers of government to uh, meet and, and deliver on these targets. So what we have in the uh, bill now published this week is quite a clear commitment under Section 5 that the minister and the government shall carry out their respective functions under this uh, law in a manner that's consistent with, first of all, the United Nations Framework Convention and also the steps in Articles 2 and 4 of the Paris Agreement. And I have a little note there on the right as to what those references are. So essentially, the United Nations Framework Convention uh, seeks to prevent dangerous climate change and seeks to bring emissions down below their 1990 levels uh, as soon as possible. Of course, the, the kind of more uh, tighter workings out of that is reflected in the Paris Agreement, which established a temperature goal in Article 2 originally to achieve two degrees of warming or to limit global warming to two degrees and to pursue 1.5. But since the IPCC report of 2018, it's quite clear that even 1.5 degrees of warming poses uh, dangerous risks and grave threats to humanity and to biodiversity. So um, the other thing is, of course, that because of the uh, reference in Article 4, or sorry, Article 2 to uh, common but differentiated responsibilities, that puts a clear onus on 
developed countries such as Ireland to step up and do their fair share of this effort, which is not just an equal share, but a fair share means stepping in, up and doing more so that we can facilitate the and support the uh, needs of developing countries. So in section six as well, the Minister of Government is also uh, asked to and was required insofar as practicable, perform his or her functions in a manner consistent with the most recently approved climate action plan, which is updated every year, and the most recently approved national long term climate action strategy. So there's a clear commitment that every minister is supposed to carry out their functions in a manner that's consistent with this overall target. Um, the annual climate action plan, um, again, this is not really new, um, new element, but it's just that the wording in this version of the bill is slightly different. What's significant here is that the minister, when he's preparing or she is preparing the plan, which is updated annually, must ensure that the plan is consistent with the carbon budget program. So we'll come to that now in a second. And it must also address any failures to uh, comply with the carbon budget. So the, there's a recognition that there must be corrective action in the event of any failure to meet the targets. The element of the carbon budget, I suppose, is the most important one here, because this is where you're putting a quantitative ceiling on emissions economy wide, covering all greenhouse gases and all sectors uh, for five year periods commencing this year, 1st of January. And that means that we're already we've already lost nearly six months of this year's uh, 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 in terms of it planning out and mapping out and discussing how that budget would be shared out. The three budgets would be introduced together, but the idea is that the last budget, the, the third budget would be provisional and could be amended uh, if necessary. But critically, and what's so important here is the section at the bottom where the first two carbon budgets, as in the one that applies up to 20, the two that apply up to 2030, must provide for a reduction of 51% in the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is very significant but because it means that the carbon budgets are in sync with the political commitment to 51%. And um, it's up to the advisory council as to how to share that out between the two budgets, but there's very limited room for them to deviate from the 51%. There's no room to deviate. Um, we discussed before at some of our webinars some of the language that created a lot of loopholes and the sort of long list of have regard to's. We talked about this alphabet soup of things that the minister and the advisory council could have regard to. And these are quite interesting because this is where you see the references to biodiversity. Um, there's no reference to least cost approaches, which was the bugbear of the 2015 Act and um, very much the approach taken by the Climate Change Advisory Council up until now. There is a reference to the need to take uh, early and cost effective action. So a lot of this language is quite good. However, the language on the just transition over here on the right side, K, is very weak, unfortunately. It really doesn't say anything at all. My apologies. And, um, you know, it seems to be just a very general reference to wanting to maximize employment opportunities as opposed to correct at the adjustment and the disruption to certain workers and certain communities and certain either sectors or geographical areas that will be particularly affected by a rapid transition away from fossil fuels. And in the same light, the reference to climate justice, which comes later on, is, is it's a very dreadful definition. It doesn't really mean anything. And it provides very little guidance to the advisory council on how to carry out its functions. So that is very disappointing. There is a reference to the special economic role of agriculture, but it doesn't change really the direction of travel. So as a result of the um, announcements, many of them this week, we also have some new appointments to the Climate Change Advisory Council, new chair has obviously been appointed already, and some additional members that bring different uh, range of perspectives uh, into the council's deliberations than is fair to say um, was true of the previous membership, which was largely dominated by economists of one type of economists or other. So it is uh, encouraging to see that there will be a range of disciplines um, represented on the council, including 
um, Andrew Murphy uh, from uh, Transport and Environment, which is a European NGO that actually made a submission as an expert witness to the Joint Oireachtas Committee very recently about transport. So it'll be good to have um, that range of uh, perspectives represented. And in addition to those members, there are three more to be added um, in the coming weeks and months. So we do have the structure in place that was laid out in the October version. And um, just if you wanted to check back over our recommendations and the Joint Oireachtas Committee recommendations, they're here. The minister insists that he's uh, implemented a good chunk, I can't remember what percentage he mentioned, of the Joint Oireachtas Committee recommendations. However, he didn't include the recommendation on banning uh, offshore exploration or banning LNG terminals. I think Oshin might address that later on. Um, which is uh, very disappointing, obviously, for a lot of climate activists. And I'm not sure if whether or not these can be introduced at committee stage or if there's a clear political commitment to do so, uh, maybe we'll find out uh, very soon. So um, just of some observations, uh, in terms of the overall governance piece, there's a lot of improvements here in this bill. It will set, I think, a much more firm foundation for climate policy, less wriggle room for politicians and civil servants and state agencies to depart from uh, the decarbonisation agenda. But laws by themselves won't make the emissions go down. So we do need sustained political will with strong institutions and a much stronger voice for our environmental and climate expertise through the council and also coming from the EPA. We need courage, I suppose, in making some bold decisions by government, by companies, and I think by local authorities. There are some interesting new functions here for local authorities. Households and individuals are going to need to be supported through this transition and we're going to need a lot more examples of what this zero carbon world is going to look like. At the moment, it's just so theoretical and abstract, it's very hard for people to get a sense of what it will mean. Um, and we're going to have to step, step up to, I'm going to let Anya address the consultation point and that's me concluded. So any further issues that I haven't mentioned, I'm sure Oshin will bring up when we get into discussion. Thank you. Stop Great. Um, so I see there's a few questions coming in the chat um, and I'm just going to ask you if there's questions come, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to go to Selena and then Rose, you can go straight after and then Oshin, you can go straight after. You're muted, Selena. Great. Thanks, uh, Anya. Thanks, Sive. And thanks, everyone, for being here this evening. And also, I suppose, even though there are some elements of the bill that we may not be happy with, it's really important to take this moment to say amazing work to all of the campaigners who did see take the action to make sure that there was a strengthening um, in, in the bill between the drafts, as Sive has just outlined. So, I mean, we need to welcome those wins as outlined, but of course, need to keep up the pressure to rectify the weaker aspects. Um, in terms of climate justice, so I'm Selena Donnelly. I work with Trocra, um, and uh, it would be no surprise to you why we're so concerned about climate impacts because um, the communities that we work with are facing those in the most horrific ways uh, at the moment. The poorest half of the world's population are responsible for only 10% of carbon emissions, and the richest 10 countries are responsible for 50% of all carbon emissions. So in terms of the reference to the to climate justice or the concept of climate justice within the bill, i.e. the principle that these poorest countries and communities in the world have done the least to cause climate change are being hit first and hardest by the crisis. And that, as I've mentioned, um, uh, wealthier countries have an uh, obligation to act accordingly. Um, in terms of the 2015 Act, there was a reference to climate justice, but it was just name-checked um, in a list of 25 items which the Climate Change Advisory Council and government must have regard to. So in terms of this um, latest iteration um, of the bill, um, the it does enshrine climate justice, but the, def the definition is really, really weak. Um, it, particularly when it's compared to the recommendations from the Joint Oireachtas Climate Action Committee, which were really quite, re quite robust. Um, so again, it does say that ministers must have regard to the principles of climate justice, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's a much weakened definition. And I hope that that's something that um, we can try to seek to ref rectify. For example, there are those international definitions available in terms of the UNFCCC, the commitment to common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. 
um, and the principles that climate justice should support those most affected, who've done the least to cause it, um, and to be informed by science, respond to science, and acknowledge the need for equitable stewardship of the world's resources, particularly biodiversity and ecosystems, um, and to help address inequality and progressively distribute the financial responsibility for climate mitigation and adaptation measures. So um, like I said, that's, that has been a bit disappointing to see. Um, so I might just leave it there because I'm conscious that we need to also move on to just transition and I'm sure there'll be other questions that will come up. Thank you. That's great. Rose? Yeah, hi, how are you doing? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on you. And I suppose I'd just like to echo what Selena just said in terms of, you know, there are lots of positive additions to this version of the climate bill. And I'd like to congratulate, you know, all of the organizations and everyone listening who's been part of that campaign to improve, you know, previous iterations. But in terms of climate justice, we in CLM think that the bill lacks the ambition needed to create or to address wider issues of inequality. So I'm just going to speak for a few minutes about climate justice what it, and what it means to the communities that we in community law and mediation work with, what we would have liked to have seen in the climate bill and why we're not happy with what's there. So I suppose firstly, climate justice recognizes that climate change has the potential to increase inequalities and also that so too can climate action, but that there's also this opportunity for climate action to build equality. So it recognizes that the climate crisis isn't just an environmental one, it's a health crisis, a housing crisis, a jobs crisis, a debt crisis, and ultimately a human crisis, a crisis that is not being and will not be borne equally by all. So it's a crisis for women, for children, for older people, for members of the traveling community, for those on low incomes, for people with disabilities, because people who are most disadvantaged or marginalized have the fewest choices about where and how they live, they have fewer resources to cope with pollution or the challenges of climate change, and they have less visibility in the shaping of policy responses. In the course of our work in CLM and our recently set up Centre for Environmental Justice, we have seen a climate change and other environmental factors directly impact people's housing due to flooding or health due to dirty air. We're also alert to the potential unfairness of climate action measures on marginalised groups, whether that is, for example, through job loss or energy poverty. So together with Vincent Paul and the Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice, we made a submission on the Climate Bill late last year, advocating for, amongst other things, changing the word shall to must in the section of the bill which Sai referred to, which sets out the list of criteria the minister must take into account in preparing the national long-term climate action strategy and the climate action plan, and also including a definition of climate justice similar to that contained in the Scottish Climate Change Act, which defines the climate justice principle as the importance of taking action to reduce global emissions and greenhouse gases and to adapt the effects of climate change in ways which firstly support the people who are most affected by climate change but who have done least the least to cause it and are the least equipped to deal to adapt to its effects but secondly to help to address inequality and helping to address inequality is a really important aspect of climate justice because this advocates intersectional responses to the climate crisis, looking at other issues such as transport, clean air, housing standards, energy costs when taking action on climate. And this has the significant benefit of dealing with wider issues of inequality, which is both morally correct, but it's also pragmatic as you'll create buy into the difficult changes that are necessary and reduce the possibility of populist backlash. So instead of what we proposed, the current bill kept the word shall rather than replacing it with a stronger term must. And the definition of climate justice, which was included, there was no definition of climate justice before. So they included this new definition of climate justice, which states, and I think it's worth saying, the requirement that decisions and actions taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt to the effects of climate change shall, and this, this phrase is important, insofar as it is practicable to do so, safeguard the rights of the most vulnerable and, and this word is important as well, endeavor to share the benefits and sorry, the burdens and benefits arising from climate change. So this language, endeavour, and as far as it is practicable to do so, is very weak. And it's also not very coherent, as I'm not entirely sure what sharing the benefits of climate change means. And from our perspective in CLM, we use the law, and, and Saib referred to this in her presentation, and, and how critical it is that the law is there as a tool to advance, you know, whatever position it is that you want to advance, for, but from our perspective, it's equality and human rights. And this definition of climate justice is not that useful tool that we hoped it would be. And it's arguable, possibly, that no definition at all might have been better, as that would have left you more scope to argue for how it should be interpreted in the courts. That's it for me. Thank you.
Super. Thanks so much, Rose. And finally, um, Oshin. Thanks, Sonia. And thanks, Rose. Uh, you took the words out of my mouth there, Rose. I was, be, I was thinking as we were going through that, that it would be better to have no definition of climate justice than, than that one, because uh, it's so weak. And if it wasn't there, we could, make it, we could appeal to the international definitions. And I definitely think we should be working to change that, uh, that definition uh, and indeed the definition of just transition. And I'll come on to the, to the, to the issues of gas in a second. I do, think it, I do think it is worth saying, I mean, we have worked in Friends of the Earth on this bill since, well, not on this bill, on the idea of a climate law since uh, April 2007, along with Trokra uh, and others. Uh, and this bill does contain the key elements of an effective climate law, if, if, if that being to hold, to force the government to set targets and hold them to account for meeting those targets and have timely plans uh, and expert led advice uh, on how to do that. And in some parts of this bill, it's much improved from, from October. There are places, I saw someone asking a question about have regard to versus are um, and consistent with. In the really key places here, it is now consistent with. It is the, the, the five-year targets consistent with the long-term target, the plans consistent with uh, the um, with the budgets and the ministerial actions consistent with uh, the plan. So that's real improvement. Uh, we do now have the key legal elements that drive action in an effective climate law. Uh, all of the things that we're talking about, uh, like all of those definitions are all with, are all in the have regard to section, which are legally weaker anyway, and which are as important in the planning of the uh, of the measures and the policies that are coming up in, in, uh, in now as you go into the consultation that, that Anya will be talking about. So we absolutely should fight for, for, for stricter definitions there, but actually that fight will be will have to continue anyway outside the uh, the arena of the bill. Like the bill is just, as I've we've said, the starting gun for the race of a lifetime to eliminate emissions fast enough to prevent climate breakdown and fairly enough to leave no one behind. But more to the point, the, the, the law is just the rules of the game. We still have to, and, and they're making the rules of the game more fair and uh, as opposed to being skewed against us and skewed towards vested interests and skewed towards privacy and fudge and dodge and delay and skewed towards open sea transparency, evidence uh, and much more public and democratic decision making. But we still have to fight every step of the way to get the actual policies and measures that will reduce emissions and to make sure that those policies and measures are in line with climate justice and, and just transition. Like they, they, this is the, the start of a, a, a more evenly matched struggle, not, not the end of, of, it at, of it at all. It is just getting us to the starting line. Um, on top of that, there were other um, other uh, commitments in the program for government that we had hoped and had campaigned for also being included in this bill. This bill is, def is essentially a governance bill. It's not a, a, an actions bill, uh, but, but there had been uh, uh, campaigning and some sort of encouragement from government that they would do some of the other things they committed to in the program for government in this bill. Uh, and they have only delivered a, a small part of that. So uh, the program for government commits to ending the issuance the issuing of new licenses for the exploration for oil and gas particularly gas was the new thing uh, to, to uh, uh, under this government there'll be no more licenses for exploring for for gas no more new licenses and it also said that they, they would issue a policy statement to um ban the importing of fracked gas and they would withdraw support for a specific LNG terminal in Shannon to import gas from the US. Uh, they would withdraw it from the kind of list it's on at the EU level that gives it privileged access to, to subsidies and to planning. Uh, so to be fair, the program for government never said any of those things would be in the law because they were promising a policy state policies and a policy statement in one case. But uh, we pushed them that they should make that they should use the law to do some of them, and so did the JOCA, the Joint Directors Committee. They have said that the, the policy to no longer issue licenses for gas will be in the law, but the text isn't ready yet. Uh, um, it, 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 it's been approved by cabinet that it happened, but the text isn't ready. It's being drafted by the legal drafters, and it, and it will be introduced at committee stage when it's going through the doyle in, a, in a, a few weeks or a month's time whenever that whenever that happens we will watch that carefully that would be good it means the next minister after this one can't decide that they'll now start issuing licenses again for exploration that's progress now of course that doesn't address existing licenses that's a whole that's the next frontier in this in this in this campaigning uh, for we have a campaign in defense of unknown new gas but they didn't promise in the program for government to affect existing licenses which is far more complex legally legally but they but uh, we are hopeful that we will get both the policy is already there not to issue licenses and now we'll get that underpinned in law but more disappointing is the issue of uh, the importing of fracked gas 
Uh, as you know, Ireland banned fracking after a long campaign, not that long actually, but a very effective campaign led by grassroots activists, primarily in, in, in Leitrim, uh, uh, and with some help from national NGOs, uh, mostly cheerleading, to be honest, um, that Ireland banned fracking, one of the first countries to ban fracking by law in 2017. But then there was a plan to start importing frac gas from under the, the feet of communities in the US who had stood by us as we, as we uh, campaigned to ban it here. And that would be hypocrisy in the extreme. Uh, this government has promised to ban the importing of frac gas, uh, but we campaigned and so did the grassroots, the grassroots campaigners that that should be underpinned in this law. So far, we haven't seen the, uh, the policy statement that the government has promised. They haven't published it nine months into the government. And they have now said that they can't underpin it in law because uh, of uh, because the, the legal advice is it's, that's not allowed. Um, now, uh, the campaigners on the ground have got legal advice from NUI Galway that it is allowed. So we'll be calling on the government to publish their legal advice uh, and the, to allow TDs and senators to see the two of them. They can commission their own legal advice and I think find a way during committee stage to put a legally appropriate uh, uh, um, amendment to the to the Doyle uh, to to strengthen this bill to to also rule out the importing of frac gas, and lastly, uh, the specific issue of the Shannon uh, terminal was never going to be directly addressed in law. You can't put into law to ban one particular building in one place. Uh, the way to do it is the frac is the is the issue of of the um, the the fr importing of frac gas because that's what that terminal is for. But it is obviously the focus of attention. And literally just this week, the government, the, that, that, that company said it's going to apply again for planning permission. Uh, and we want the government to be more clear that it, is not, it doesn't qualify for EU subsidies because it's still on one, of the, on one list that, it's not on the new list that will be effective next year, but it's still on a current list that would give it, give it uh, advantages. So we want the government to be stronger in withdrawing any advantages that that, that, that application might have as it goes through uh, the, the planning process here. Super. Thanks so much, Oshin. Um, So what we're going to move on to now, and then we will move into to Q&A, and I know that we're running a bit behind time, um, so we might run a bit after seven, um, but I'll keep this piece short because we will have the opportunity to engage with the piece that I'm going to talk about now um, a lot over the next eight weeks. And so what Oshin, Rose, Selena and Saif have just spoken about is the climate um, bill, which will become the climate law. And that's the framework. That is the, you know, the rules of the game. And what the consultation that has just been launched is about the climate action plan. So this is the government saying, we're going to make a plan that has actions that will help us achieve these emissions targets um, and these goals that we have set out in law. And we want to ask the public what they should be. Um, so I have a quick... Um, I can show you here. So there's two sections that we can um, engage with around the climate action consultation. Um, and if you go, you'll go to gov.ie forward slash consultation. That's what you'll find. Um, there is a thing called a climate conversation, and that's an individual survey that individuals do. Um, and the second thing is a call for expert evidence. And that is also something that individuals can do. Um, but it's something that really groups um, are encouraged to do, but we will kind of be encouraging people to, to submit to both. Um, and I'll tell you why now in a second. Um, but those are the two key pieces that the public um, can engage with. Why we think it's good, we've been calling for this for years. It's really, really important um, that people are engaged um, and consulted on climate action, that the government don't just do top down things um, or expect people to do things by, by themselves. Um, Rose mentioned a bit earlier that it's really important that there's consultation with marginalized groups in particular, um, with rural communities, with youth. It's important that everyone is consulted so there is so people feel engaged, people feel buy-in, people feel like they can co-create these solutions um, and they want to engage with these solutions. And you'll know yourself if you feel like you've been spoken to about something, if you feel like you know a lot about it, you're more likely to engage with something. And this is an amazing opportunity for us to tell the government what we want them to do. We do have some concerns. Um, and in a second, I'm going to let both Sive and um, Gary from USI come in with a couple of extra pieces here. Um, the, one of the key concerns is around the fact that um, young people under 16 are not um, eligible to take the individual survey. 
um, NYCI, the National Youth Council, are one of our members, and they're really concerned about this because, as we know, it's the Fridays for Future, it's the school strikers, it's the young people who have been taking so much action on climate change. They're so knowledgeable about the solutions, they're so knowledgeable about the issues. And also young people, regardless of whether they're taking action, are the ones who are really going to bear the brunt um, of climate breakdown. Um, and there isn't really space within that uh, individual consultation for them to take action. And it's so important that their voices are deemed um, powerful and important in these consultations. Um, there, there is engagement through Corlin and Oog, um, but that is not deemed by the National Youth Council to be enough, broad enough um, for, the, for the amount of young people out there um, that really care about this issue. And I suppose the key thing is this, this consultation is not just supposed to be for people who you know, are already active on climate. This should be everyone's voices. Everyone is gonna be needed to, to be involved in the solutions around climate. So we really want these consultations to be you know, reaching as many people as possible and hearing as many voices as possible. Um, and that also comes down to this question about marginalized and rural communities who are possibly more likely not to, to be engaged in um, climate activism and um, it's not necessarily everyone um, but uh, and those are the communities who will be most hit by some of the changes um, and some of the, the climate actions that uh, governments are likely to take around land use change um, and around um, how we change our energy systems and so it's really really important that those voices are heard to make sure that the changes that we make the actions that government take don't negatively affect um, those communities and that there is buy-in from those communities. Um, it's only eight weeks. There's not enough time, a lot of time for meaningful engagement with the people. There's not enough time to say, here are the issues, here are the, here's some of the solutions, go away, have a think, come back, and now let us know what do you want um, so people can make informed decisions. And we're worried that there's not enough time there. And finally, we are concerned that the individual survey does put a lot of focus on the individual um, and less focus on government. Um, I'm going to hand over to Oshin, or Sive and um, Sive now and uh, Gary, who are just going to come on with two other small concerns that we have, and then we're going to get on to the action. So, yeah, Sive, I, do you want to go first? I'm not going to, to talk at length, but just to point out that our understanding is that while the public consultations are running, the government, the Department of Climate Action, is also d developing the next climate action plan. However, it's likely that the plan, which is being drawn up by a consultancy, not by officials in the department, but by a consultancy in McKinsey, um, is going to be prepared before the climate budgets are announced by the new Climate Change Advisory Council. So even though there's a sort of sequencing set out in the legislation, it looks as though both the public consultation and the public engagement is happening um, you know, too late to influence the content of the climate action plan and the climate action plan is happening too late to influence the carbon budgets. So it seems as though things are happening at least in this year in reverse order and that's very disappointing. Um, thanks Sive. Um, and we know that the department are seeing this as a pilot um, so they, they are committing that this will happen every year um, so hopefully the next iteration of this next year will be done more in sequence. But yeah, that's one of our concerns at the moment. Um, Gary, do you just want to come in and talk a little bit about um, what you're seeing with the consultation and how it affects the, the people that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it's important to note it's being said, but I don't think it can be said enough that when we're, when we're having these important conversations around uh, climate, around biodiversity and kind of safeguarding the future, it's not just for our well-being, but it's also for the, the well-being and the goodness uh, for, for those to come. And uh, so just to kind of reiterate and, and just say that we, we did see a bit of a lack of, so while it's good that these conversations are happening, it's good that there's a bill, it's good uh, to an extent there is a, a consultation. I I think it's important to note that I suppose youth have not been included, not from what we can see, uh, have not been included enough in these conversations and could be brought a lot more into the fold. So just, just to back that point, in terms of our membership, um, which is kind of uh, 18 and, and, and over, um, we really feel like um, there's a lot there kind of inhibiting them in, in that conversation. For instance, in, in the consultation itself, there's quite a lot of um, questions there 
around um, accommodation. But I think it's important to note Eamon Ryan, uh, Minister Ryan himself said that if you ask any person uh, in the country of, around the age of uh, 20 to 25 about accommodation, the big concern there is just that they have um, accommodation. That's a big, huge worry. And there's an acknowledgement there that there is an accommodation um, crisis. So there's, there's in, the quest, in the questions there, um, there is a bit of a, a separation then between the younger generation uh, and the older and the questions that are being asked. And we would really like to see um, both the youth and uh, the older generation kind of brought in uh, as one on that conversation. Um, and we would really like to see yeah, youth brought more uh, into the fold. I know in terms of our membership uh, in the USI, we're representing 375,000 uh, students across the island of Ireland. And um, we're not seeing a lot of engagement there with uh, student representatives, with uh, student reps, um, with a focus on uh, sustainability and, and, and all, all things to do with climate action. So there's, there's a lot of groups there and there's a massive resource there that could be really brought more into the fold that um, unfortunately we, we, we haven't quite seen uh, in this consultation. So, so it is great that there is a consultation, that there is some engagement there, but we'd, we'd like to see um, a lot more. Uh, great, thanks Gary. Okay, so I'm just gonna share uh, once more and then um, so while we do have these concerns, we also still really think that it is really, 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 really important that as many people as possible do um, fill out this consultation, do engage with these consultations, um, because we really want to show the government that people want action. They want really strong, ambitious, faster and fairer climate action. Um, so, yeah, we've got some issues with it, but um, we do want people to take action. I'm just going to show you very quickly what the consultation looks like if you haven't already seen it. Um, so there's lots of different sections. I'm just showing you quickly the one on travel um, and how we're going to support you around filling this out because um, there's some very, um, there's some tick box bits. Uh, so uh, in most of the sections you're asked, you know, what are you already doing? Um, do you want to do more of it? Yes, no, things like that. Um, it's up to you what you think about these options that they're offering you. Um, but then there's these broader questions. So where do you plan to do more of? What do you want more of? How do you want the government to support you? So in each section, there's a few of these um, open boxes. And that's really where, you know, it can get quite overwhelming. I mean, I work in the climate space. And I think if I had to sit down and do this by myself, I would get quite overwhelmed and be not 100% sure of what I might put in. Um, so we will be giving you support um, around filling these out for sure. Um, so, and really what we want to say is a, a lot of, we want to make sure that we tell the government that the rules are wrong at the moment. A lot of the rules, a lot of the questions they're asking are around, you know, how can we help you do more? Or what are you already doing? Or what are you already not doing? Um, and we really want to tell the government, you know, a lot of the reasons that people aren't able to live or it's unaffordable to live um, the sustainable lifestyles that we need to bring down these emissions um, is because it's very difficult or it's very unaffordable. The rules that exist in our society don't aren't conducive to us, to us living in, in sustainable ways. Um, so we need the rules changed in a way that leaves no one behind and creates a better Ireland for all of us who live here. Um, and so really, that's the kind of messaging that we want to be giving the government um, from a soft climate chaos perspective. You're your own people. You're allowed to you can fill these out in whatever way you like. But from a soft climate chaos perspective, we will be supporting and giving you templates and um, uh, ways that you can to support you to engage with this kind of messaging. Um, so with the individual consultation, we'll provide you examples to help you fill out those big boxes. Um, and then we will be suggesting that you do engage with that call for evidence piece, that bigger piece, which does look even scarier um, than the other consultation. Um, but we provide you with lots of templates, lots of support. You can do it in groups. You can do it um, by yourself, get together with a few people in your community. Um, we'll be hosting webinars on the topics that you and so that you and your community can dig into them and decide what you want to say. And um, we won't be being prescriptive. We won't tell you what to say, but we're going to give you um, some facts, some information so you can make these decisions. Um, and I saw someone earlier in the Q&A box said, you know, I'm going in. There's a, there's another section that's of consultation that's happening through PPNs. And I think someone is attending 
one of those tonight and they said, look, there's no information there for people who don't know anything. So it's very hard to make suggestions to the government if you don't have any information. And um, so we will be hosting webinars. And I do encourage, you know, if you're some, if you're an expert in an area or if you know a lot about an area, do, do start sharing that. You can share with us and we can use that to inform our webinars. Um, and we can also share that documentation with, with others because this is really about everyone in the country going, this is, this is what we want. This is what we want government to do. This is the Ireland that we want to live in. This is what we want to see. And making sure that that action um, is fair for everyone. So I'm going to finish it there. And I, as I said, we will be having way more engagement on this part of um, on this piece of work. Um, so, so yeah, keep an eye on your emails, on our social media, um, and we will be engaging with you further on that um, and with, stop, uh, with one future groups in particular. Um, but yeah, just to clarify, the climate bill is the, is the rules, the targets, and the climate action plan, the consultation is the things that we're going to do to get um, to those targets. So, okay, we're gonna go to the Q&A and the very, very top question, let me see. Some of the top ones have, have moved on here because Okay, so answered, maybe answered, yourself or Sive who have been looking at it would like to. I'll have it. Can I just yeah, come in um, because there was quite a few questions about the legal implications of the bill and I've answered some of them, but um, I don't know if you've seen them all, Oshin. But one was, um, you know, what will happen if the targets aren't met? In what ways are the ministers and the government open to legal challenge if they don't comply with these measures? What if we don't achieve 51% reductions by 2030? So if you can take those, that'd yeah, be great. Sure, I'll try. Uh, and I, 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 my answer definitely won't be complete. And obviously, also, we don't have a huge amount of time. The in the first instance, across the world where climate laws are brought in, it, 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 it's not the first resort that we go to court. Like, that's not the idea. The whole idea of the climate law is that we have action, is that we have plans and that we implement plans and that there's, there's, there's uh, checks and balances to ensure that there is action. And, the, uh, and in other countries, and we hope here, there is more action when you have a climate law than when you don't have a climate law. So the idea is that it drives action as opposed to simply that you, you, fa you still fail to act and then you're brought to court. Because ultimately, if we end up having to rely only on court, it'll be too late. As in, for, I mean, I was to take the most obvious example, the net zero by, 20, by 2050, you know, if we have to wait to 2051 to bring them to court for not meeting that, obviously in, in so many ways, that's all wrong. Uh, so I, I think there's three layers uh, that I see, and but this is my analysis from yesterday, and Saeed so may have uh, uh, other thoughts on this. The first is there's an annual accountability cycle that uh, every year the, the newly empowered Climate Change Advisory Council will produce a, um, an assessment of how things are doing and sector by sector say where they think things are off track and propose new actions uh, to help things get back on track if, if a sector is off track. And every year, uh, the climate action plan will be updated uh, by the minister with the similar public participation process as now, uh, updated in response to the actual numbers we have on, on emissions and, the, and the, uh, the report from the Climate Council. And effectively, therefore, it's supposed to be a corrective mechanism to get, to get back on track. And the minister, I think, has to explain if, it, if he's not following what, or she's not following what the Climate Council is, um, is uh, is, is proposing. And then there is the setting, the cycle of setting the carbon budgets and uh, every five years, that's every year. So every five years we're setting an, another carbon budget uh, and we're assessing where we are. And the way the bill is written now, if you are a minister responsible for a sector that has not uh, met your target, you, you don't get your slate wiped clean. You have to like, take that extra burden across with you. And obviously you'd have, you'll have been receiving your warnings all along and you'll effectively be be, uh, be held to account at that five-year basis. Now, it's not like there's no financial penalties uh, at that point. Um, there is, of course, the EU law begins to kick in at that point. If we have if we have 2030 targets under EU laws, there is financial penalties for not meeting those. Uh, but then thirdly, there is our, our, our resort as citizens or as NGOs uh, uh, to court in the same way as under the much weaker climate bill that we campaigned for for eight years, the 2015 bill, in the same way that Friends of the Irish Environment brought the government to court because the national mitigation plan wasn't in line with, the, with the, even with the weak bill, uh, and the national mitigation plan wouldn't even have existed if it wasn't for that that law. 
and it was struck down by the Supreme Court. So the language in this bill is much stronger. The links between the different elements is much stronger. If the government fails to produce a plan on, uh, that, is, that is in line with the targets or in line with Paris, there's plenty of opportunities here for, for us to take them to, for, take, for, take, for, for them to be taken to court. And the fact that they're, they are announcing that it's justiciable, like 10 years ago when there was quite a good climate law, the government was saying it wouldn't be justiciable. They wrote it into the law, it wouldn't be justiciable. The same attorney general now saying, we know this, saying to all of the, the system that, guys, you can be taken to court on this. And the Taoiseach saying in the announcement, this is justiciable. You can be taken to court. This will drive action in the system. That's a really strong signal that they know they're on the hook legally and therefore hopefully, hopefully driving action now to avoid court rather than waiting around until we take them to court in, in three or four years' time. You're muted, Safe. Can I ask you another question just that came up from a couple of participants, Oshin, about the legislative process from here? Um, if you haven't covered it already, can you lay out for us what you think the time scale is for the bill as it goes through the doll and what scope there is to make amendments and sure. how we should go about lobbying for the changes that we want sure. to see? And I just uh, one observation, and I'm conscious of, of me talking and over the other's time too, on the sequencing. I mean, you you commented the sequencing is less than ideal. I, I would in this case say it's not entirely the government's fault in this case. For example, I'm the one who insisted that the carbon budget period be 2021 to 2025 and not as they might have put in. Uh, if they were left to their own devices, 2022 to 2025, because I wanted the carbon budgets to be of equal length, uh, because otherwise it becomes too easy for them to fudge the numbers and look like they're going down when they're not or whatever. I wanted three five-year carbon budgets. It's fine that we're pla that the carbon budget for this five-year period isn't announced until six months through the first year, because we know already the outlines of it, and, and that, 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 that doesn't prevent the actions being decided. It would, of course, be better if the carbon budget was decided before the action plan was decided. But if they were saying to us now, we won't have an action, it's going to take six months for the, for the Climate Council to come up with the carbon budget. Uh, so we won't have a new action plan for another a year. We would be up in arms because they're already almost a year into government. They have this 7% a year promise. We need to see the, their plans to, to, to do that because it's twice as much as the last government was planning and therefore twice as much as the, as the, out the existing plan. We need to see their new ideas. We need to see their new, their new policies. So it's okay that they prepare that in parallel. Now, obviously the McKinsey thing shouldn't trump what we say and I would, we will, we'll fight every inch of the way for all our good ideas to be incorporated, but it's okay that they start preparing their new plan. If they weren't, they would be remiss, they would be negligent. Uh, and I understand that they are, the Climate Council is already beginning work on the, on the carbon budget. And, and I hope, this is what happened in the UK back in 2008, as soon as the, as the law goes live and the council has its new legal status, it'll produce its first carbon budget uh, for recommendation uh, to the Doyle. So hopefully we can catch up this sequence by midsummer. summer can, it can become more logically ordered. As to how, how, the, how the process goes, I mean, in, in Ireland, we tend to either do emergency legislation in the course of four days or else it takes 18 months or two years. Hopefully we can find a happy medium here uh, and we can get this law and we, we can give it due time in the Doyle so that it gets through all the scrutiny that it should get from TDs and senators. And there's opportunities to introduce amendments. And I'll talk about that in a second on the one hand. But on the other hand, that we aren't left without the legal imperative to act for too long. So I would, I would be hopeful we could get it into law as strongly as possible, uh, I said improved as much as possible, but in law by, by the summer. Uh, the process now is that uh, there's only two more sitting days of the Doyle before the Easter break, uh, so it won't be going into the Doyle before Easter, so therefore it'll be the second half of April before the big set piece first debate in the Doyle, called the second stage debate, confusingly, uh, and after that, and we presume that's on the principle of the bill, like do we want to have legislation on climate, so we'd expect lots of talk about the, uh, the good bits and the bad bits, and we'd expect probably all parties to support the principle of the legislation, and then it goes into committee for amendments, uh, and so I expect that'll be happening in May sometime. Uh, and there'll be a chance for TDs and senators from all parties, or all, all people on the committee, all parties on the committee, to put down amendments there. There's a second, and, and that'll be discussed with the minister, and there'll be vote, votes, etc. There's a second chance then, back in back in the last plenary session in the all the report stage, to have for more amendments. Uh, and then, uh, so I would expect, it's, I would hope it's through the Doyle by the end of May, the beginning of June, let's say the uh, World Environment Day on the 5th of June, uh, second stage debate on Earth Day, 22nd of April, uh, through the Doyle by the 5th of June, and then they've got to do it all again in the Senate. 
so, you know, it could be the end of June before it's finished. It could be uh, the middle of July uh, when, when the Doyle and Shannon rise for the summer. I would hope we'll have the, the law in, uh, um, passed by then and signed by Michael D. Higgins, but with ample opportunity for TDs and senators to put down amendments, whether it's on fracking, whether it's to, to, uh, to improve the language on, on climate justice, just transition or other areas, or indeed, if they won't accept those, to delete the, the language, the definition of, just, of, of climate justice. We can do a lot in, 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 the, in the time available. And I'm sure lots of organizations will, will be proposing amendments that, that TDs and senators could consider putting down formally. Um. We're going to go to a question on agriculture in a second, but I just wanted to note that there's a lot of people saying, oh, we should do this and we should do this and we should do this. Um, and I think that's really where um, this consultation is, is really where you, you, you say that to the government, you say, this is what I want to see. Um, I've also seen that there's messages coming in from for Gary saying that some people want to organize mass student submissions. So it's really this is a great opportunity to really get this to as many people as possible and, and use it as an education piece as well. Um, so yeah, be thinking about where are your communities and, and where can we be um, encouraging people to make submissions on this. Um, Saif. Yes, um, uh, Sean, I think, asked a question about how agriculture is going to be treated in the bill. And this is actually quite a significant thing. Um, the agricultural lobby was seeking and has been uh, in its messaging over the last number of years, seeking to make the claim that Irish agriculture is a very efficient that you know we shouldn't be penalized for the fact that we're producing high quality high quality food that's for export and that methane is by the way a lot less uh, damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide so it should be treated differently um, now a lot of these claims don't actually stand up um, but interestingly um, the the bill does not really make any exceptions for agricultural emissions. So it's quite clear from the way the bill is designed that all emissions are to be covered in the climate action plans, the long term strategy and also in the carbon budgets. And it doesn't say it, but it's understood that the emissions will be quantified together with some sort of metric like carbon dioxide equivalents. At the point when you start, uh, when the minister allocates a sectoral emission ceiling to different sectors, that is where the divvy out of the carbon budget is going to have to happen. And this is something we fought for. We made the case all along that agriculture shouldn't be treated differently initially. It should be uh, within the overall carbon budget. And it should be very clear that if agriculture is treated differently from other sectors, that that's a zero sum issue. That means that transport and energy, and we're going to have to, you know, you know, multiply our efforts uh, and accelerate our efforts beyond what is necessarily feasible in order to uh, allow farming to continue these very high emissions. So agriculture emits about 35% of Ireland's total emissions. And a great deal of these emissions are coming from enteric fermentation from livestock, essentially uh, methane gases. But the livestock herd is propped up in, uh, uh, you know, by imports and application of nitrogen fertilizer. So it, it's, a, it's a different sector, it requires different treatment. And it, clearly we're going to need to curb nitrogen inputs and nitrogen uh, feed, artificial fertilizer and feed. And we're going to have to look at the herd size, um, which in, in, in a way prompts a discussion about the future of our agriculture cultural model, which has been very focused on uh, livestock and commodities, beef and dairy over the last uh, 20 years or so. So the, the increase in the herd is not sustainable. There is an interesting piece in the Irish Farmers Journal today, which suggests that to meet the target set out in the bill, that the herd would have to be reduced by up to 2 million, perhaps. Perhaps there are other changes that could be made as well, but they're very limited in what they can deliver in terms of emission reduction. But to answer the question, no, there is no special treatment for agriculture in this legislation. And that's a good thing. That means that agriculture is going to have to make its case alongside other sectors for a fair share of the Irish uh, carbon budget. Um, and they're going to have to do an awful lot of work to reduce emissions. And they cannot anymore pretend that they are some kind of exception because it's going to be challenging for every sector. Thank you. Um, I'm just seeing now. Um, there's a few people asking questions and I don't know, maybe um, Selena might be able to come in here um, and maybe Sive as well um, around, you know, have we examples of climate budget, carbon budgets in other countries, um, legally binding ones um, and people asking, how do we hold ministers to task? How will, will we be able to hold ministers to task?
either of you. Can you hear me? Hello? Both five, you're muted, I think. Would you mind just asking that question again, Anya? I'm terribly sorry, but I was fiddling and I just didn't quite catch the full question. Um, so people are asking about whether there are carbon budgets in um, other countries or other places, oh, yes. legally binding right. ones, and how can we hold um, ministers to task if they don't? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. I mean, there are examples of carbon budgets working quite well in other countries. The UK is the best example. Uh, they are not really compliant with the current, the third carbon budget, but they have succeeded in reducing emissions. So the carbon budgets don't in themselves reduce emissions. What they do is they create a numerical kind of transparency. They create a ledger and you can see what's causing emissions, what's releasing emissions, whether it's cars, whether it's uh, power generation, whether it's buildings and construction activity, whether it's cement production, whether it's uh, farming in certain kind of ways. Um, you can see when you have that kind of transparent list of the causes of emissions, what your options are if you have to operate under a limit. So the beauty of the carbon budgets is you get that kind of transparency and that you're dealing with numbers and you're dealing with physics. You're not dealing with rhetoric and you're not dealing with waffly political commitments. So in terms of the law actually making sure that these things are adhered to, that's a different question. I think we shouldn't underestimate the need for sustained political will to actually ensure that these are met. But in terms of the kind of planning and the kind of rule setting and frameworks for government expenditures and policies, the carbon budgets should provide a, a good framework for a coherent climate action. Um, and I think it might take a while for them to get bedded down. Um, it's not going to be instantaneous, but for the first time, we're going to have a consistent and coherent understanding of what we have to do as a country, um, cross government, all state agencies, everybody pointing in the same direction for the first time. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think actually there's loads and loads and loads of questions. And I think over the next, um, couple of weeks we will be trying to answer these questions as we tease out some of the stuff in the bill some of the questions um may not be things that we actually have the answers to it's a shame um there's some kind of legal questions and it's a shame rose had to leave um so early because she's a lawyer so she knows those kind of legal pieces and um, but what we will be doing over the next um number of weeks is the bill is likely to come into the doll in the maybe in a month's time because we've got the easter break um, so we will be looking at, you know, what is our strategy? What do we want to change? Um, what about um, what about amendments and things like that? Um, so we will be giving you a strategy for engaging with politicians, for engaging with TDs, for doing bottom up organizing on this. And we also will be, as I said, um, engaging with you really strongly on the consultation. Um, there's so many questions, there's so many ideas coming in, there's people talking about, I know that I saw there's someone there um, talking about some of the issues in Donegal, so it's really, really, really powerful for you to have those stories, to talk about the issues that you are seeing, um, with because uh, some climate actions are just and some are unjust, some are fair and some can be unfair. Um, so it is really, really important that we um, acknowledge that um, and that we tell the government that we want ambitious climate action, climate action that will get us to our targets, but climate action that is fair. Um, so the next two months, the consultation is closing on the 18th. The bill is likely to um, go to the doll on around the 22nd. So the next two months will be quite packed, quite important. Um, and we don't want to tire you out um, straight away. Um, so we will be in touch. Uh, from all our different organizations um, and Staff Climate Chaos. So keep in touch, stay in touch with our mailing lists. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time out this evening as I've slowly des descended into the darkness um, to be with us um, and we will be in touch. Um, so have a lovely evening and um, good night. And thanks so much to our panelists. Thanks to Gary and Saib and Selena and Rose and Oshin um, who are here earlier. <laughs>